And today we will be exclusively in the Psalm of the Bible, Psalm 119, in which is the longest chapter in all of the Bible. And that makes it unique. And the second thing that makes it unique is every single one of its verses in some way or another have to do with the Bible, with the Word of God. Most of us have been led to an unquenchable thirst and an insatiable appetite for information and communication. The baby boomer generation, which is well represented in this auditorium this morning, saw the first home televisions. Then we saw the first home color televisions. The Gen Xers celebrated the first portable CD players. Until then, you remember you had those big stereo systems in your home. Generation Y rejoiced at the first iPods. Can you believe that was that long ago? I still sometimes use an iPod that's about 25 or 30 years old. And the millennials were the first to take smartphones to school. We saturate ourselves with information, sometimes at the cost of face-to-face -face conversations. So in this maelstrom of information, it's sometimes hard to remember that God still wants to speak to us too. In fact, one of the first things we learn about God in Genesis is that he reveals himself in words. Just the first chapter of the first book in the Bible, Genesis, uses God said 11 times. God didn't stop speaking then at creation either. He still speaks today. The question is, how do we hear his voice? There are more Bibles in print and in people's homes today than ever before. And when you account how many also have it on their phones, their iPads, their computers, their laptops, it's amazing that there are more Bibles available right now than at any time in the history of the world. Yet, many people suffer from spiritual anorexia. They're still starving to death from spiritual illiteracy. So the Christian Post did a survey to thousands of churchgoers these are people who are church attenders and discovered that one in seven read their Bible every day. One in seven of churchgoers. Now that might be surprising, but this is shocking. An equal number, one in seven of churchgoers said they never read their Bible at all. So, that leads us to an obvious question. Why don't believers and church attenders read the Bible? And I'm not going to ask out loud, but if you don't, why don't you? I think there are probably three top reasons. Perhaps when you ask yourself this question, you find yourself saying one of these three answers. I don't know where to begin. That's one of the reasons that we did Love Your Bible last year and a year and a half ago, because we showed you exactly where to begin and how to study the Bible chronologically, which is the best way to understand its message. A second reason is the scariest one. This one's the one that bothers me the most, where people say, I don't see its relevance. 
Increasingly, we are being convinced by the modern, secular, anti-Bible, humanistic world that the Bible has no real reference for us. It's a thousand-year-old book with no real meaning or importance or reference to us today. And a third answer that some people would say is, I don't know how to find things. All of those are weak answers, and we'll talk about some of them as we move on today. It's awfully easy to feel like you just have stuffed God into a Sunday morning worship experience and left him there. And for many people, God sits right on the shelf at home next to the Bible. The Bible is not picked up, neither is he. <laughs> and the psalmist makes a very interesting and amazing statement about the Bible that is not true of any other book that has ever been written. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. So there are two things I want to point out about that that makes the Bible the most unique book in the world. First of all, it's eternal. There's no other book in the world that's eternal. None. Second, it stands firm in the heavens. It is in heaven. Now, the Word of God is. No other book that's ever been published or printed is in heaven right now. Jesus put it this way, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away in Matthew 24, verse 35. So add that third piece of evidence to these two, and you see the validity of an eternal book standing in the heavens that will never pass away, though everything else we see does. The famous atheist Voltaire once held up a Bible and said, in 50 years, I will have this book in the morgue. 50 years to the day, 50 years to the day, Voltaire was in the morgue, and the Geneva Bible Society owned his home and used it as a place to store Bibles as a Bible warehouse. <laughs> I love it. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Now, I want you to appreciate the miracle of this book, since we're in the Psalm of the Bible, every verse has to do with the Bible. I want you to appreciate the miracle of this book in a unique way. This was one of the things as an early Christian in my late teens, this was one of those things that I just could not get away from. Helped really build the truth of God and the scriptures into my mind. The 66 books contained in the Bible were written by 40 different authors over approximately 1,600 years in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Now just think about that for a moment. They didn't have satellite technology, they didn't have phones, they didn't have easy transportation, they didn't have any transportation other than donkeys, horses, and feet. They did not have access to one another really in any way. Most of them never even met the others of them. And yet, this message, which could have been jumbled and confusing full of errors and disproved, never has been. In fact, it is pointed toward one central unifying message. These books have been divided into two sections, the Old Testament, or sometimes called the Covenant, and the New Testament, or the New Covenant. The Old Covenant has 39 books, the New Covenant has 27 books, and yet they are all threaded with the same promise of the Messiah who would redeem the world. Now watch this. 
watch this, just as the Bible itself, these 66 books written by 40 different authors of all kinds of background, little or no access to one another over 1,600 years, just as it points to a similar theme, both the Old and New Testament points to one similar theme all the way through and ends with the theme, the Messiah. Did you know that the New Testament has roughly 300 explicit quotations from the Old Testament? And close to 4,000 references to the New Testament. In fact, the Old Testament makes the promise that someone is coming to deal with the problem of sin, and the New Testament says, well, that someone has come, that promise has been fulfilled, and his name is Jesus. So even though the Bible that you hold in your hand is actually a library of books, it all has one purpose, point you to the Messiah, the only one who can save you and lead you into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You don't even have to be a believer to appreciate the Bible. You don't. It certainly is better if you are, but you don't have to be. The Bible is rich in story and poetry and imagery. Some colleges, not Christian colleges, some secular colleges teach whole courses on the Bible as literature. So we can certainly approach the Bible like any other book, or we can approach it with hope and faith that it will affect our lives, that its message is true and powerful. And for that to happen, we first have to look at the author and be confident about the author. Or how many of you in here are, would define yourself as readers? That is, you read a book on a fairly regular basis, you're reading a book. Okay. Well, I'm probably way beyond, way beyond you. Up until we started giving away my library a couple, three years ago, I had over 4,000 books. I still, after giving away so many, Diane just keeps saying it at Amazon every week as they come to the door, I thought you were giving them all away. I, and I'm back over 2,000, and I, and I keep two or three books going all the time. But when I appraise a book to read, I read, first of all, I read the reviews, the good and the bad, on Amazon or Goodreads or maybe even some other uh, book review. I read the back cover reviews, and I read the inside flaps. In other words, and this is every single book, in other words, I appraise the book on several <laughs> levels, from the author to the publisher to the length, but the most important piece is to weigh the value of the author. It, I, if I know this author has really been good before and has motivated me and excited me before, and caused me to think or caused me to laugh before, that will be the first thing that will draw me to the book. Well, the psalmist here appraised God's Word like I appraise in buying a book. And he said, you are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statues you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. To say that God is righteous means that he always does the right thing, that he always does what needs to be done. He does what his holy nature requires him to do, and all of his actions are trustworthy and just. So if the author is just, then the work that he produces will likely follow suit. If we could trust that God is a worthy author and trustworthy, then we can conclude that his word will not disappoint. That's important for you to remember with all the critics of the Bible today who are trying to point out any little small detail. The Bible is not some irrelevant ancient writing. 
It was the Word of God who was and is and is to come. And so many times the Bible has proved itself to be accurate. I don't know how many of you know about or are familiar, maybe some of the preachers in our audience are familiar with a magazine called Biblical Archaeology. And Biblical Archaeology is really, a, uh, it's been around for a long, long time. And what they do is they are constantly involved in archaeology, often around the uh, Middle East and in the Holy Land, but in other places as well. And they are, they continue over and over again to find archaeological findings that prove as a fact <laughs> the truth of the scriptures. It's amazing. You know, you're not going to see it covered on CNN. You're not going to see it in USA Today, but you do see it sometimes at the Christian Post or in Christianity Today or on uh, certainly on Biblical Archaeology Review. And it's amazing all the things that have been found, including very recently, some new findings again concerning David. Of all the charges that God brought against his people, one stands out to me more than the others. The prophet Hosea wrote, I wrote for them the many things of my law, but they regarded them as something foreign. In other words, the people of Israel at the time of Hosea and his prophecy, treated God's word as foreign. A foreigner had no home in Israel, no permanent dwelling place, no land. That person had no voice. That person had no right to vote. God said, you're my people. You've got all those things <laughs> that were just mentioned, but you still treat my word as something foreign. It has no voice in the way you live your life. When it comes to how you conduct your affairs, my word is ignored. You know what scares me? What scares me today is that seems to be a sin that is repeating itself. Even among many of God's people and even among many churchgoers, I think it's a cultural thing more than it is a truth thing. I think it's a cultural thing that ultimately, if you were to ask them about their true beliefs and their lifestyle, it could also be said of them, they regard God and his word as something foreign. So let me ask you this morning this question as we delve further into the Psalm of the Bible. What is your true appraisal of the Bible? Can you trust the author? Do you have doubts about God's Word? You see, the Bible contains treasure troves of spiritual jewels just waiting to be collected. It just can't wait. God can't wait for us to open our eyes, open His book, and see wonderful things in His law. There is not a day in your life that you do not need to hear from God. There is not a day in your life that you don't need to listen to Him. That, that stat of one in seven churchgoers never read the Bible, that just uh, amazed me. That's a lot of people who are never picking up, studying, or reading the Bible. You say, well, how do you, how do you get into the practice of it? How do you do it? Well, we've offered you so many opportunities through the years. I mean, we have done the one-year Bible about every four or five years where we all read it together. We've done the half of the one-year Bible where we don't read every single word, but we read portions there. We've done Love Your Bible where we did the, the entire Bible message in chronological order. We have kept Love Your Bible up on uh, both of our media platforms on Facebook and on YouTube, every Love Your Bible message, every worship, uh, everything that's taught from here is archived on YouTube and you can easily find it. So we have done what we can do to try to make Bible study more 
uh, interesting and compelling for you. But ultimately, it does take you deciding. How do I understand the Bible is a question I often get. Where do I start? It really is not that difficult. The first thing I would say to you is, if you really want to know and learn the Bible, you simply have to personalize it. Make it a part, I'm not gonna say every day, but make it a regular part of your schedule. And when you take a passage of scripture, and there's be so many easy ways to do this, one of the easiest ways you do this is by taking the, the, um, the text that I'm gonna preach on in the service today. Study that text all week. Study it in several different translations. Study about it, and you can do all this for free. You can just find these translations online and read out of Bible Gateway. Read it out of different translations in Bible Gateway. Then go to different Bible commentaries and read all about it there and study it really in depth. That's a very easy way to do it. Is to, do you know there are churches that are doing that right now? There's a church I just learned of two weeks ago. There's a church in Canada that split and they had about uh, 20 members and about 10 or 12 of them have formed a house church and they use our service for their service and then afterwards for their Sunday school, they do exactly what I'm talking about to you right now. They break down the passage that was preached in the service and have a Bible study discussion of it. This is not brain surgery. There are a lot of very easy ways that are handed to us to figure out how to study the Word of God. And with every text of Scripture, simply ask, Three or four questions. What does this passage say to the original reader? Because, as you've heard me say this over and over again, it cannot mean something to you and me that it did not mean to the original reader. So you've, this is about context. What did this passage say to the original reader? Second, what was the author trying to accomplish or communicate? What's the purpose behind what he was trying to do? Third, is there a timeless truth in this passage that I should believe or obey? And fourth, how am I going to respond to what God has said here? Is there some response I need to make to what I'm reading? And then, and memorize key verses that speak to your heart. Yeah, we memorize a lot of things. If I were to start right now and start going around the room, start here with Mike and Donnie and then Brenda and back to Jack, uh, I bet, I bet, and I said, quickly, give me your social security number. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't give anybody your social security number. Enough people already have it, trust me. But if I were to say that, I'll bet every one of them, but maybe Jack could do, <laughs> could do that. Because this just so we're used to memorizing, we know that. Sorry, Jack. We memorize other people's birthdays, you know. You probably know your husband or your wife's, you better know your husband or your wife's birthday. You better know your husband or your wife's anniversary. You better know your children's birthdays. We memorize jokes so we can tell them over and over again to people. We memorize sports scores, and we can also memorize scripture. We can, when we care enough about it, we can memorize Scripture. And there are lots of different ways to do it. The best way I've ever learned to do it, as I've told you over and over and over again, is through the prayer of the heart. I'll take a Scripture till I've fully memorized it, say it every morning in the shower over and over and over again, plant it in my brain, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Twenty times I'll say that. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I will rejoice in the Lord today. 20 times, and it comes back to you through the day. I've, I've done two things. I've memorized Scripture, and I've planted it as a seed that the Holy Spirit can bring it back into my heart. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. That's probably my most common one. It's, it's probably the most needed one in the society in which we live. 
I'll say that 15, 20 times. Amazing to me how many times God brings it back to me through the day. You've done two things. You've memorized Scripture just like Jesus told the devil in the temptations of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, right? Uh, you live by the Word of God and the Word of God alone. So you've memorized Scripture and you've allowed the Holy Spirit to help you through your day. So you memorize, another way to do it is write a verse on a card and put it wherever you'll see it, put it on your mirror, put it in your car if you're driving a lot, and God can bring it to your mind as you need it. And then simply, you do it. You do what it tells you to do. So if you do those steps, if you, when you personalize the Bible, memorize the Bible, and actualize it, it will make an enormous difference. It can even revolutionize your life. I put great in, uh, emphasis this morning on reading your Bible, but it's not enough just to read it. You've got to reproduce it in your life. When I was growing up as a Christian in the Radnor Church in Nashville, we used to sing a song a lot called How Shall... How uh, secure their heart. How shall a young person, show, I can't remember the exact title, S secure their heart and guard their lives from sin. How many of you remember that song? We haven't sung it in a long, long, long time. Well, it comes directly from this verse. How can a young person stay, on, and I love singing the words of Scripture. I think those are the best songs. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? If I am to do the word and not just hear it, that raises the question of what has the final say in my life. When I'm forced to face reality with my back against the wall and I got to decide how I'm going to respond or react, where do I turn to make that decision? And that's why this verse is so important. How can a young person do that? Because most of the time, the people who make rash, dumb, peer pressure-induced decisions are younger people. I think that's why the verse really identifies here more to younger people. So how do I make that happen? Now, sometimes people will, will uh, make a compliment to me on a message and, and, and say, I wish I had heard that when I was younger. Or, I wish I had known that before I got married. And I want to say, well, <laughs> it was all right there <laughs> in the Bible. You didn't have to wait on me <laughs> to tell you, because it's true. God's truth is available to all of us on an equal level. <laughs> on an equal level. It's just as open to you as it is to me. We simply need to appreciate it and appraise it and apply it in our life. Now, the longest chapter in the Bible sits right in the middle of the Bible. Did you know that? If you were able to just open your Bible and, and have from, Re from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 and to perfectly open it right down the middle, you would be in Psalm 119 on the third page most likely, depending on the print you're using, on the third page, and this is the verse you would read. You could almost literally say this is the middle verse in the entire Bible. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Now, you only need a lamp and a light when? When it's dark. Yeah. You don't need it when you can see. You need a lamp or a light only if you're in the dark. And when the psalmist spoke of God's Word, he was talking about writings that were already hundreds of years old. The, the only verb in the entire verse here is in the present tense. I want you to watch this. He didn't say the word was a lamp and a light. 
He said the word is a lamp and a light. So immediately that tells us something about the Bible and why we need to read it. We live in darkness, spiritual darkness, the entirety of our lives, even as we are making the biggest decisions that affect our lives, such as who to marry, where to work, where to live, whether or not to have children, how many children to have, who to associate with, where to go to church. We may worry about all kinds of things. We may worry about tomorrow, but the truth is, we really can't even see the next second. We are truly in the dark. That's why we need light and a lamp. Think about the metaphors from this verse for a moment, if you would. A lamp shows you where you are. A light shows you where you are trying to go. A lamp pinpoints your present location, but it has limitations. A light points out your future direction. A lamp is used in the house to show you where you are, but it has its limitations. A light is used outside the house so that you don't stumble or fall in the darkness. When we grasp this analogy, my friends, we see why we need to flip our Bible switch on every single day. This one short verse tells us that one practical reason to read the Bible every day is that it will tell us where to travel. It will tell us where we belong. It will identify our present location, and it will identify our future location. It's such a powerful verse. Metaphorically and in reality, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Did you know the term Bible is never found in the Bible. How many of you know that? The term Bible is never once found in the Bible. Do you know what the Bible's term is for itself? Hmm? All right, what else? Okay, everything I've heard is correct. All right, let me challenge you to do this. Go read all of Psalm 119. And you will find an amazing number of words that are used for the Bible in Psalm 119. I mean, it'll be called precepts, judgments, truth, word, everything that everybody said in the audience is true, and dozens more that it is called in the Psalm of the Bible in Psalm 19. But for the most part, there's one word that is used throughout the scripture, not just in Psalm 119, to describe the Bible. Luke called it this way. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And actually it left off half the screen that I was looking for there. The first part of that text says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. All the scriptures concerning himself. Now, the word scripture comes from the Greek word graphai, which means that which is written. I believe God wanted us to have something that we could hold in our hand and place in our heart to guide us in what we believe to be our scripture. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wherever your feet are, there you are also. (laughs) You can't, or at least shouldn't, be separate from your feet. 
It's impossible to be someplace where your feet are not. A lamp can tell you not only where you are, but it can also tell if you're standing in a good place or a bad place and how to get to the next place. Now, there are two ditches the church can fall into when we let anything other than the Bible have authority over our beliefs. I have been in one of these ditches for sure in my lifetime. I've probably nibbled over in to the other one a time or two as well. The first ditch is uh, legalism. Legalism in which we substitute our human opinions for God's authority. And we go extra biblical. In school, we used to call it extra Jesus. Instead of exegesis, we called it extra Jesus. And you, you just began to promote your own ideas and thoughts and impressions and interpretations onto the Scripture That's legalism. The other ditch on the other side is liberalism, which tempts us not only to believe the wrong things, but maybe even to believe all things. America's in more danger from liberalism right now than it is from legalism, partially because of our culture, but both of the ditches are dangerous. And we fall into those ditches when we use statements like, we've never done it that way before, or... We've always done it this way before. Both are just a way of saying it really doesn't matter what the Bible says. We'll save ourselves a lot of heartache and a lot of pointless arguments if we simply let the Bible be the lamp to guide us in where we need to believe. Let me ask you a personal question as we get close to closing. Do you have any skeletons in your closet, anything you don't want the person sitting next to you or across the aisle from you to know? Things that you regret, things that you wish you hadn't done. Every time you failed, it was likely because you didn't have God's direction or you didn't understand it. The best way to fight temptation and get rid of regret is to do what verse 11 says. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Every single word in this verse is important. I just wonder how many sins would have been avoided if we truly had hidden God's word in our heart so that when temptation came our way, we were reminded of it and we wouldn't sin against him. I can't read this verse. I really cannot read this verse without thinking of the man who wrote most of the Psalms, David, and how much trouble David could have saved himself and his whole family. Because when we think about David's sin with Bathsheba and the the ultimate cover-up and murder of her husband, uh, Uriah, we don't often think about the other fourfold punishments that God handed down to David, which means eventually his own family, his own sons would rebel against him, which Absalom did. The whole nation would know of his, the shame of his sin, which they did, and lost respect for him. The baby would die, which it did. I mean, there were four very serious consequences that were handed down, and I can't help but think that if David had simply let the word be a lamp unto his feet and a light unto his path, that he would have remembered that he had hidden the word of God in his heart and he simply would not have committed that horrific sin. Every word in this verse is important too. Feet refer to where you are, that is what you believe, And the path refers to where you are going and how you behave. And you need the Word to be a light for both. Psalm 37, 23 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in me. How many of you really consider yourself very computer literate? Raise your hand. Oh, my goodness. 
oh, that's way, way below what I thought. Look, can I, just in case you weren't listening, can we start over? Just in case you weren't listening, how many of you consider yourself to be pretty computer literate? Raise your hand. How many of you do not? Some of you apparently do not know what a computer is because you did not vote. Becoming computer literate is a constant work in progress for me. Now, I have come a long way from where I was, but I can actually now fix some things, not much. And one of the things that I've learned is that a computer has only so much memory. Once the hard drive is full, that's it. It can't make room for any more. When the hard drive of your heart and mind is full of God's Word and you have hidden God's Word in your heart so that you might not sin against Him, when the hardware and your heart and mind is full of this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. I've hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. There's just not much room for Satan to find a place to store files. <laughs> there won't be any room because the memory is full. And so Psalm 119, 133 concludes our thoughts this morning by saying, direct my footsteps according to your word and let no sin rule over me.